Hello everyone, welcome back. If you've done ballet and you've been singing this morning, fantastic, well done. If not, welcome. First session of the day, we love that too. Uh, we're very privileged to have the wonderful Stephen Kavuma with us uh, here um, uh, today. We're going to be chatting about his career. Just a little, uh, if you this is your first time on the platform and you're watching, if you are a subscriber, you can actually go and into the live comments and you can ask us questions. We always say ask um, as soon as you have a question because there can be a slight delay in us receiving it and we don't want to miss anything. Um, so let me bring him in now. Hello, Stephen, how are you doing? Hi everyone. Hi, I'm good. Thanks. How are you? Good, good. So, um, let's just go straight into it. Thank you so much for being here. It's it's, it's a privilege to have you here. Um, uh, let's start right at the beginning. Like the arts, why? Why did you choose the arts? Why did anyone? Um, why? Yeah, your, where did you start? Start there. How did how did you get into it? Um, I think for me, how we started it started was that um. I think it started when I was like six or seven. I always loved like stories and making up things as a kid and um, writing weird things. Or like when I was watching shows, I'd always finish when they had cliffhangers, I'd always go and imagine them and finish them off and write them off myself. Um, and I, I just really enjoyed doing that. And then, um, when I was really young, I was watching Doctor Who and became a huge fan of the show. And I was living in Wales at the time, I was brought up in Swansea. And so the show was huge in Wales, you know. Um, and I, I, I was just like, oh my God, this is actually what, what I wanna do. Like, I wanna, I wanna be an actor and I wanna do that and, and tell stories in that way. And still kind of kept my passion for writing because that was the thing for me that's inside of me as a little boy. Um, so I think that's where it started. And sort of investigated bit by bit, really, the older I got, I started thinking, okay, cool, how can this be a career? How can I do this and sustain myself as, as an artist um, and get paid doing it? Um, and went to college um, and did the performing art we did acting and it was great and I loved it. And then I think in my second year, everything changed. I discovered me as an artist, not just an actor. And that's where my focus wanted to be. And I wanted to direct and I wanted to write uh, and I wanted to put things together and, and putting things together might be producing. I don't, I don't necessarily call it producing for me. It just means bringing people together. Um, and my passion for me for that was because I saw when I was in college, I think in my first year, I saw this um, the college teacher gave us this like diagram of people in the arts industry and where everyone's at. And it was like from the top to the bottom and right at the bottom was, was, the, was the actor. And I thought to myself, I was like, oh man, I really wanna make a change in this industry. I really wanna change um, what kind of, you know, shows that I'm given as an actor and, and and what kind of stories I'm allowed to tell as an actor. And it felt to me that being an actor was very restrictive. It felt to me that I wouldn't be able to be in those rooms to change things. I wouldn't be able to say, actually, hold on a minute, this is the story I want to tell. It's about this guy, or it's about this woman, or it's about this person, and they're going through this thing rather than being told, do this, do that, do this, stay here, go there, whatever. That to me was an interesting thing. Um, and I remember telling someone actually that I wanted to be an, a, a director and, and, and write, and then they said to me, you wouldn't make it, you wouldn't do it. Like, you, why, why are you even changing? What's the point? Um, and it felt on like people were telling me that I wouldn't be able to be a director, I wouldn't be able to be a writer. So it just felt to me to push it, push further. Um, so I think that's where it started and I went to drama school, uh, I went to Central School of Speech and Drama and I hated my three years there, hated it. Um, but it also allowed me to, to say this is what I'm about. It gave me that place where I could really, in those three years, think about who I want to be as an artist and what stories were important for me to tell. Um, yeah, that's a bit, sorry, it went really long. 
That's no, it's, it's just what it's about. No, that's not that's fantastic. Um, I have uh, family. I, I'm half Welsh, and a lot of my family oh, live in Yeah, so oh, um, I, grew, I grew up actually in a, a place called uh, Llantut Major near Cowbridge, which is kind of more towards Cardiff Way um, as yeah. a kid. So, um, so yeah, so there you go. Nice little connection there. Um, mm. It's 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 wonderful that I, I you know we talk about uh we, do, we go into drum schools as casting directors a lot and we talk that that's your that's the kind of your starting point for a lot of people they always they get they do amateur dramatics or they watch films or theater and they go this is where i want to start as an actor and we often say you know at a mm -hmm. class of 20 or 30 you lot will become producers you'll become writers you'll become directors you too will stay as actors and it is a thing you've got to find that that passion or, or you start with a passion and it can change en route um something that we've been talking a lot mm. about um uh on on the platform is is people's influences and so who are your what as well as wanting to create those stories i love that that you ended the cliffhangers i i think that's amazing um I, that's just a, a a wonderful thing um a great sort of uh way of storytelling or or, or kind of like working on your craft of storytelling but who were your who were your influences who who was it as an actor that you were like wow they just they're they're great influences and who is directors um and writers influence you yeah i think um i think i'm influenced by so many things um i think it's not just one person or one thing i think it's all these group things and people and sometimes I'm in interviews for for jobs and somebody asks me that my heart really beats because I don't for me sometimes it doesn't mean I have a direct person that I can say it's that person who's like put me here and has influenced me and is the reason why I'm here it's sort of of all other things so in terms of people that I'm influenced by you know James Baldwin and um, Nina Simone because the way she makes music and the way she speaks about her music and the way she speaks about people, black people. Um, there's, there's so many like people, I'm influenced like in politics and, and how politics kind of goes through life and how politicians make big decisions that affect so many people and yet they don't know it. Uh, I'm influenced by that power and that way of trickle down things, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, there's so, so many things. Um, and also it's it interesting. Means for me, sorry. No, go for it, go for it, go for it. No, it just, for me, it means, for me as a writer, I'm very responsive. So I never, it's very rare that I have a direct idea or something that I want to write. It's always about what's happening and how can I respond to that? Or what do I have to say for that? Um, and sometimes like I'm responsive to my experience as a Welsh black person and I'm like, okay, cool. I want to write that story. I want to investigate it. I want to investigate what happened there and what went on. Or it's like, there's this thing happening. Um, and this, you know, person in the chicken shop or in the coffee shop or whatever say something. I'm like, I'm investigated in seeing that. And I think that's where it kind of started as a kid writing those cliffhangers was more, I was responsive and investigated to finding out what happens after the end. Where did those characters go? Where do they live? What happens? And um, yeah, it's always been kind of that. I love that. It was, I think when I grew up, I was very, <clears throat> I was about 50, born 50 years too late. And uh, <clears throat> I was very, well, 30 years too late. I loved, um, grew up with jazz and, and and all of that kind of stuff. And, and music, as a, as a kid, I grew up um, not following a band. Uh, all my mm -hmm. mates were, into bands, so mad. But I was into like, I like that song from that band, and I like that. And these things kind of influence me as a, as a performer, as a creative, as a, as I grew up. That a little bit like you're saying, you kind of become responsive. And and I, I guess that with with me as a creative, and a bit like us doing the CCI, uh, is to a uh, sort of very responsive person to what is going on around me, to what that what might be created on that day, or what how my acting when i was an actor how i might be influenced as i want to i want to i want to try that journey because mm. the thing is now this the, the environment is now affecting me so now i don't i don't want to necessarily do that right now i'll leave i want to go on this journey do you find is that is that what you're saying as well that you find that that you're just sort of you absorb 
what's going on around you and just let that influence you as a as an artist and as a director yeah, absolutely i don't think you can ever come to um I don't think you can ever come in with a plan of like, this is exactly what I'm going to do and this is exactly how it's going to be done. Or else it's just stale, I think. It's a stale way of storytelling. You know, when I go into rehearsals and something major happens outside the rehearsal, I always bring it in because that's important. It might change the way we see the play. It might change the way we see the characters. Yeah. It might make us think deeper about who these people are and what we're saying as artists when we go on that stage. Um, and it's the same as a writer, you know, um, each draft changes for me because something happens in the world and I have to kind of respond to it. I have to be like, okay, cool. How are these characters, if this is happening in the real world and the present time, how are these characters going to like respond to the pandemic? How are these characters going to respond to these cats? Like, what does it say about their lives and how are they going to respond to this government? Like, what's that? And what does that look like? It might not be a political play. And it's not necessary about politics, yeah. yeah. But it's also about sort of responding to the to the world. Yeah, I I can't remember the writer, but it really made me laugh. And uh, he was talking about uh, writing about Donald Trump, and he was trying to write a play about Donald Trump. And he every single day he, he was had to rewrite the scenes. He couldn't keep, and eventually yeah. he just went, "Sorry, I can't do this." This is ridiculous. He is actually impossible to write about because there's too much. There's too much stuff yeah. like, <laughs> on the head. He came, came up with this idea, which I, I kind of love. Um, something so Black Lives Matter uh, that that all happening was, I, I think, kind of what came out of the tragedy was what for me was was so exciting that you know. <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous that we're even still having these conversations. It's mm. absolutely ridiculous. But the thing out of it that came out of it for me, which was uh, mind blowing, was racism in drama schools. Yeah. And I honestly put, I, I had, we had communications. Again, we we connect with a lot of drama schools, not not necessarily the London ones. So it was very much we were northwest based originally uh, in Liverpool, and we became very much about. Um, not London centric. So we would go to small places in Scotland and all over the country, places that other casting directors didn't go, A, a for time and everything. And it was a big thing for us to, to make sure that we were not London centric based. And then a lot of these uh, drama schools got together and they contacted us and talked us through wanting our take or our advice or whatever on racism, racism in drama schools. And it, it, I just, I sat with my mouth open, I have to be honest, because it just, it blew my mind. Um, and, and so let's talk about diversity school. Um, obviously, I, you know, that, did that come about because of this? And if so, isn't that nuts that that is even a, a thing that was necessary? Talk me through, yeah. talk me through that. Yeah, so diversity school started in my first year of drama school at Central and I like realized it's really crazy to explain it. Sometimes some of these things are about feelings, it's about how you feel going into an institution. Nobody can be, um, sometimes like racism can have different ways of, of manifesting itself. And one of them is about um, how you feel walking into a place um, and you can't really describe it. And how I felt walking into Central sometimes was very uncomfortable. Um, and then kind of like, as the months went on, looking around and realizing actually this school isn't really diverse. Like when the lunch times came and I saw other people, I just was always seeing white people. Um, and in my year of my course, I was the only black male in a year of 90 students. So it was just to me, it was just like crazy. And it was tiny in the sense was like, I just came from this college where 90% of the students were black or Asian. That's huge, and and um, I, it kind of really freaked me out that there could be another institution, probably thirty minutes away from the college that I went to, and it looks completely like it's a different town or city, um, and so kind of set this event up called Dear White People to challenge the school to be better and to ask them, you know, what do we need to do? How do we need to do it? And the event featured like lots of different people on the panel and um, it also featured testimonies from students about how they feel being a black student or an Asian student in Central uh, or um, someone who is uh, of colour 
Um, and then I went to the school and then the school was like, we don't think there needs a change or a problem. Like nothing is wrong, basically. And I was like, oh, hold on. Something is very wrong. There's m lots of many wrong things that's happening. Um, and the time, uh, Mame Twa, who was in the year above me, um, was also someone I spoke to closely about, about these things and was also a mentor to me. Um, because she was someone who I could see in a place that was like, um, she was studying as well, but she was like my elder. So I like recognized myself in her. And Mumba Jodwell, who came to the event um, and was um, doing a podcast, she was starting out to the podcast celebrating uh, lots of black and Asian creatives in the industry. Um, and so we had a chat with us three, Mumba, Mame, and myself, and we sort of said, what can we do? What needs to be done to like, you know, sort this out. And we we decided to set up the Diversity School Initiative, basically to support students um, and to keep drama schools accountable. It always felt to us how crazy it is that we should be asking or bargaining for this when we're paying for this. You know, we're paying for our education, so it should be my given right to say, I don't like this and I don't think you're training me enough. And it's not actually just about, I don't like this. It's about what are you, training me are you facilitating for me as a black person as a brand person are you facilitating me for me as a working class class person like what are you how do you how can you make sure that I can succeed in this industry and if you're not doing that then I don't think you're doing your job and therefore I have to question myself why am I paying you you know why am I going in debt for you um yeah so that always felt right for us that students should have the right to say and and the initiative has now become a broader thing about diversity in the sense of you know uh, lgbt rights working class rights um gender and sexuality um and looking at issues that affect students and not just like issues about the toilet or the printer because those are not those don't affect um it's not that they're not important but they don't have direct impact to people say if you're black or if you're working class say if you can't afford to come to you know your audition that has a direct impact to you um and um it's crazy i think often we talk we talk to ourselves and say it's crazy that we're allowed to exist um in in as an organization it's crazy that they should be an organization such as diversity school, but that's what we are. You know. But that's what blows my mind. That's what has, and and I think, and it's it's uh, ignorant for me to say this as a as a white person that I didn't even realise um, that the that that what it what it you know racism in college, colleges, homophobia. I mean, good lord, we're in the arts. This is where it, it should be safe that that every single um, person of any sexuality race whatever whatever is supposed to be safe and it 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 angered uh, me and rosie i mean to our core that we were even having these conversations it, it blew my mind mm. but the other thing that really came about and and the ignorant part i mean is that that i that i didn't know about it and that that made me even more angry that mm. that, that, didn't, that, 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 that i didn't realize um, and it then became very uh, prominent for us to start to change and having this platform to really ignite and really um, show, shine the light on these things because it is wrong and it should not be existing and it should not happen. And quite frankly, have 10 students and make it work. That's what I say. Don't try and fill it with 60. You know, mm. you've got to show it. There's got to be the mix of what the arts are and it has to be the mix of what society is and that is it's we've got to get rid of the elitism and that's mm. it simple as that the big thing that, that got in fact as, as you can probably sound here i've got passionate um the big thing for us though was when we came to this platform we we had a very short space of time from from when we got the funding we had we had nine to twelve days to to go from from yes you've got the funding to build the website find the streaming get faculty on board build the calendar 
the whole thing we did in 12 days and that wow. just two of us and and the, the entire thing so once we'd said there of course we went to friends first you know get those first two weeks of of classes set up and then but then we went on uh instagram and social media to to literally to search for diversity in all areas and connect and people that we've connected with and we haven't worked with and get them on as quickly as possible show that this is where we want to take this we sat there and we went right. Where's the um, where's the Asian or Black Andrew Lloyd Webber? Mm. They don't exist. Right. Okay. Where's the where's the Black or Asian or East Asian Southeast Asian um, director uh, artistic director of? Oh no, they don't exist. And suddenly, that's when it became apparent for us mm. that actually, when you look above a certain level within the arts, it ain't there unless it is specific to a theatre company created to make sure that that, that that area is looked after. And that is the outrage that we felt. That's, the, that's yeah. where we know. And that's ridiculous. That has to change, right? That has that, to yeah, change. Yeah, it has to. It needs to. It needs to. Like, it needs to. I mean, for the... I mean, I think a lot... Um, you know, recently when we've been through this lockdown and a lot of people saying, you know, theatre needs to survive and we need to save theatre and we need to save the arts. And to be frankly honest with you, um, I'm not very keen on saving the arts if it was, if it stays what it was. Um, and I think there needs to be a moment of reflection and everyone's rushing to get plays back on or rushing to program things on. And I understand that there's an economic rush to that. I understand there's a reason to why you're rushing because you need to save your you know your theatres and I do get that but I don't I don't I don't think people have done the reflection I don't think people have done the work I, I think people have apologized and said sorry and whatever but I don't think they've really sat down and said okay cool we're going to program this artist we're going to tell these stories we're going to commission you know these people we're going to develop these artists um because our theatre can't just represent us right because that's what we're doing that's what lots of industries and lots of theatres are doing they're only reflecting themselves um, and they still expect me as a black person to save their theatre. I don't want to save your theatre if you're going to just refl reflect yourself. You know, I'll save it if you're going to look at everyone together. So, yeah, I think there needs to be a, a long time for theatres to just do the work before they even like program or do something or get back in. Um, yeah. Hmm, <laughs> definitely. You know, it's and and you can go back in institutions and you can go back. I graduated from drum school uh twenty-four and a half years ago, and I go back and I've gone back through my mind and I've gone back through all the big institutions and gone, no, nope, no, nope, didn't no, nope, chose that person, that one, no, nope, good. And I've literally this this platform, this having to ask these questions has made me go back through 25 years and gone, no. We have fa failed, 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 failed. And the thing about it is, is that in certain communities, as we've spoken with um, British Asian actors, and we've had them on and done Q and A's and, and so on and so forth, and there's some communities that don't really, you know, it's it's not um, an area that they necessarily want their children to go in. You know, they 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 the children are third generation, and they want them to to go and earn money and have a good career. But also part of it what we've been told is that there's no one to look towards there's no one out there that that they go yes but look look who's doing it so they go oh show me who's doing it and it's all you know they're all white people so of course that is part of this whole issue do you feel that as well yeah i feel i feel that i, I feel like um yeah i feel that it is that and but also i feel like it's about development and it's about opportunity and it's about um, that person who we're asking to look up to that person could be the person we develop you know it could be the person yeah. we ask to tell the story it could be that um, and I think yeah I don't know I think we need to tell lots of stories that reflect the diversity or or the lived experiences of people who are not just white um, and people need to see themselves the way cinema sort of works the way you kind of you know watch something and you go wow i really like that i want to tell it i want to tell that story and i go tell it um oh wow i really like that filmmaker and that filmmaker inspired me because the way they did this and that theater kind of lacks that 
Um, it lacks that because it only tells and holds a very narrow kind of view of who tells stories and who's allowed to tell stories and how we tell stories. Even if they're black bodies on stages, um, they're still in a Western way of storytelling or not even in a Western way, but they, they just still feel. Well, somebody, somebody said, somebody said, I read this article and this kind of, this summed it up in a, in a, in a great, great manner for me was stop, stop telling stories that have been, that are white stories and think you're doing okay by sticking some black and brown people on stage telling that that's not diversity. That's just, yeah. That's that's box ticking. What we yeah. should be doing is forget this. God, come on! There are a million stories. Why do we repeat the same ones? Why do we have to yeah. see the same stuff? It's not diversity by no. Aren't we being wild and crazy? Look, we did this. Tell the stories that should be told to tell those stories. With that's real diversity. Tell the, yeah. tell the stories of of how. Do you, what are your thoughts on that? Because yeah, I, I, I totally enjoy. agree. Uh, by the way, thanks, Yvonne and Sheila. <laughs> yes. um, yeah. let, me, let me bring these in here. I was going to say these. Hi, Stephen. Keep up the good work. I'm proud of your achievements and your fight for diversity in the industry. And it's Sheila, the opportunities in diverse lives. Yes, exactly. It was Sheila that we had on. Uh, Sheila is uh, British Asian, and we had her on for a candid Q&A, and it was brilliant. And it was just, it really stung. Uh, actually, it came from her asking a question on another Q&A, and we were like, yes get you on we want these conversations so absolutely so yeah um yeah we interrupted so yes yeah, so, so that's that's that was a really interesting take on it let's stop producing work that let's create let's put work on that actually matches and creates diversity on stage yeah and reflects the diversity of our world and the stories of our world and what's happening you know um I think that's the only way you kind of do it. And I think we sort of need to kind of, as, as, as you know, people who are in positions of power need to stop telling us what stories we should be watching or, or hearing or whatever. Those people need to respond to what's happening in the world. Sometimes some of these places are so far away attached from the real world. Like some of them are museums and, and they like, smell and feel like old people old white people and you're like well that doesn't actually reflect what's happening in the reality of this world um it, like as i said when i went into central it felt like i'm in another town or city and it didn't feel like i was in in camden which is one of the most diverse boroughs in, in london like it yeah. didn't feel like that um so we sort of have to respond and reflect to what's happening in the world and and, and who what's going on what are those stories but I also feel like the hard work lies and the responsibility lies on white people. Um, and uh, white people as everyone, not as just the stakeholders. I think we were all at a time where we were hashtagging Black Lives Matter and we were talking about this and that. And now that time has kind of went away. That moment that we were having in during lockdown has sort of faded away and everyone thinks everything's back to normal. Like Black lives are sorted and uh oh, equality is back on the table when theaters are gonna no that doesn't happen that's not gonna happen um so if white people don't do that work and don't keep banging on the table don't keep asking those theaters to do this and this those theaters won't do it so we need white people to go on and do the work that we've been doing for so long that i've been doing or that so many other directors have been doing I think um, it's what you said earlier about the theatre industry and about saving it. It's a really interesting take on it. And, you know, right at the beginning of this, we were talking about, um, you know, it is it is time. If you didn't like the way things were, we can change this. The, the, the industry will not be completely as it was. There's no way after after this, and it shouldn't be. Um, and it's, it's now's the chance. Yeah, it's almost like... Uh, like uh, what we've been saying is a renaissance. So if you feel the things that you feel as a as an artist that you want to change, you can change, but you you do have to get up and change it. You have to put that pen to paper. It's it's you have to write those letters. You have to be involved in those. And that is whatever your background, sexuality, mm -hmm. gender, all of it. It is time to make those changes. But you know, 
it, it, it would, I think it would break my heart if we went back and it was, it was exactly like you said, look at that. It's exactly the way that we left it. That would be, that would be quite I think impressive. It's gonna be, I, I think it's going to be much worse. And I think we have to be ready for that in a way. We have to prepare ourselves. Um, mm. Because as, as we know, um, telling diverse stories, whether they be black, brown, working class, or you know, LGBT stories, or stories that do not exist in the, in the way we think of the norm, um, those stories have been always told as if they don't sell. You know, those stories have never been the box office hits, and that's always a constant thing. And now, as theatres are in, you know, this world of having to, you know, raise the money and having to get things moving back, I think it's going to be a real scary time going backwards. Um, I think we're going to see more shows with celebrities. Um, and don't get me wrong, love celebrities when you know, love a show with Judy Dench in it and and all that stuff and whatever but those seem to be the only stories that people always tell and we're going to see more stories with them now because i want to interrupt you because it, this is really important and i don't want to forget if, if you don't mind i'm so sorry but i want to interrupt you there because it is again something that we're when i say we it's me and rosie i know you've communicated with rosie uh, through email uh, that we're very very passionate about and it is that thing that it goes, I'll go back to music as an example of how I will attempt to explain what I'm going to say. Um, if you go back, you could go back to Baroque music. Um, at that time, they would have said there will be no other music. You could go to the 1920s and you can have jazz and that there will be a time where they go, there will be no other music and rock and roll. And then the 60s and the 70s and all these things, now music today and how it does change. And why I, I give that as my example first, if we don't put on Cyrano de Bergerac and we put on play X and that's all they have to go and see, trust me, they'll go and watch it. It's as simple as that. If we give the options to the audience that we think this is all they want to watch, then no, it won't change. Of course it won't change. No, I love yeah. Cyrano de Bergerac, don't get me wrong, but you know what I'm saying. It's like... Yeah. If we can fill our theatres and tell people this is what you watch now and this is you don't have to you don't have to think it's good it might be you know we're still going to get good stuff we're still going to get rubbish that's not the point whether or not exactly what you're saying whether or not we want these institutions and it is the institutions because they will get the money and they will still be there and all the smaller it's all the, all the smaller places will crumble and we have to fight for those who exist but the point of it is, if we only put on X, Y, and Z, and not A, B, C, they're not there, then they will go and watch it, and they will yeah. learn, and they will still enjoy it. How do you feel about that? <laughs> Absolutely. I think that's, that's Isn't it? Yeah. It's that's kind of that's kind of it. Like, don't yeah. put don't put it on. Don't don't put that. Don't even program that stuff. Don't program it. Yeah, people still come. People yeah. will still buy tickets, uh, and actually, that that audience, that new audience, that that renaissance, that liberation, that it will come. We all will. It will still because we'll be we will be gagging for live entertainment. So this is actually the best point because if we only get, I will literally when I'm ready to, I will go and watch anything. I don't care. Yeah. I it can be a man playing spoons. I will go and watch it because I'm so desperate for live theatre, live entertainment. We're producing a, a one-man show called Stay Awake, Jake. It's a musical, not a woman, but it's, there's one actor in it. Stay Awake, Jake, and we're producing the album of it at the moment. And I walked into the rehearsals and there was strings and all, and I just burst into tears because I haven't had any live, and all the creators were watching because they'd all been through it. I haven't had, heard any live music for so long, and it's a part mm -hmm. of my soul. But if we go back and we put on all those shows that we've seen a thousand times, then we're going to be, as you say, I feel we'll be in trouble. Yeah, we will. How, so with, um, you're going to, let's move on. <laughs> a, bit, a bit passionate about this, you probably get. Um, <laughs> and, uh, so you're going to Arts Ed. Tell us about that. Yeah. Um, I'm going to... Um, I'm, I'm the new course yeah. leader of... Jay says, uh, I'll brush up on my spoon skills. Thanks, Jay. 
<laughs> yes. So what are you going to be doing there? Uh, I'm the new course leader on the Acting Foundation course. Brilliant. Acting. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to start. I think a lot of my passion has been about how we train um, and also just about diversity and accessibility to training, but how we train and how we uh, allow um, people to soak up information. And to me, it feels important that the heart of it is not asking, never thinking about power structures. For me, I'm not the most important person in the room. I'm not even the, the important person in the room. Everyone in the room, uh, in the rehearsal, as I like to call it, is important. Um, and they have a reason why they're there and they have something to say. And it's important that we hear them and we support them as a room. And I always felt that, that never happened in drama school, in their training. Um, and I feel it's important to not call them students. I feel it's important to call them artists. I feel the moment they arrive to art set, they're artists because they've chosen that path and they've like investigated in the reasons why they want to tell these stories or why they want to be here or what's important for them. Um, so I feel that's also important to recognize. Um, it's for me, it's about being in a collaboration um, and understanding that and, and allowing them to experience as many different tutors who are from different backgrounds and who tell amazing stories so that they feel fully equipped to go in the industry or go to drama school or go to anywhere, or even it might not be drama school. Um, I feel they need to be fully equipped for the future and we need to equip them and we need to listen and respond to what they're saying to us. And I mean, that's the most important thing about training, really. It's not about what we feel it's right to train them, you know, or what we feel it's right that they should get out. It's about them saying, this is where I want to go and how do I get there, mm. you know? Because they, they might not know or they might know and it's about saying, how can we support you to get there? And I feel like it's the most, being art said is the most perfect place for me to be at right now because they're doing that. Judy Spencer is amazingly doing it so effortlessly. It looks easy and I know it's not, but it looks easy when Judy does it because she knows and understands um, our lives, you know. And I think she is, she is the first uh, black woman, black person, to be at the head of a school. You know, she's the school, she's the director of the School of Acting. Um, so that's, that's important to have somebody in that position who understands and is there to support you and is there to listen to you and is there to really do all the things anyone should be doing. Um, so it's so important that I feel like it's perfect that I'm there, but it's also important that those students have someone like myself and Julie and not even just Judy, but all the other amazing tutors and acting and heads of departments who reflect the diversity of the people that we're asking to come in. You know, a lot of drum schools have changed the student body and that's amazing, that's brilliant. That's one of the steps. The other steps are to getting rid of the staff body that doesn't reflect those students because those students will still suffer in a way they've been suffering um, before they even got there. So we need to support them and have the right support systems for them um, that's there. Yeah. Definitely, fantastic. I wanna go back to something you said earlier, which I, which I loved, was when you were looking at the scale and you were looking at the people at the top and all the way down and at the bottom uh, you were showing and there was the actor at the bottom. And this is, again, something that we've always been very passionate about changing as casting directors um, and certainly as, when I was an actor. And that is, you know, that realization <laughs> And you say it to an actor and they kind of go, oh, that it doesn't matter what a, what a writer writes or if there's di a director directs. You can give a producer 50 million quid. Without an actor, you don't have anything. And yeah. it really needs to be seen that not just names and stars and things, but that there is that importance, that weight put into every single performer, an actor, a dancer, a musician, a singer, whatever their profession is within uh, within the performing arts. And to, to really like, you know, we really need to emphasize that actually the actors are the most vital role within the whole infrastructure of, of what we are, because mm. if you don't have the National Theatre building, if you don't have actors in it, you don't have an audience. It's as simple as that. 
if you don't have musicians, you don't have an audience. So if you don't mm. have that performer, and so I think it's amazing. I think I love that approach. I was I did the very first year of the London School of Musical Theatre, and the first day they said to us, "You're a company. This is how you will be trained." Um, I don't know how they do now. I think they keep that a value, but there were sixteen of us, and we were trained like a company, and it was brilliant. It was. Yeah, exactly what you're saying. I think it's, it's also really important to to say that no one knows anything. No one really, and it's okay to say I don't know, because I feel like a lot of uh, people who come to drama school feel pressured to know everything. You know, they feel it's important to be the most like intelligent person, and it's actually not about that. You might not have all these answers, and you don't need to have all these answers because the course hasn't finished yet. And you yeah. won't ever get those answers, even if you go into the industry. Um, so I think it's important to say, I, for me to say to them, that I don't know, and I won't know everything. And it's okay that you don't know, and you won't know everything as well. And it's okay to learn as we go on. Um, and I think it's so important to, one of the things I feel like training has never done is to say, to feel able to, to say to the person who's in charge of the rehearsal room or is in charge of the lecture, to say, I disagree with you and I think you're wrong. And to me, it's so, so important that someone in my rehearsal room, someone in my class can say, I disagree with you and I think that's wrong. I think the way we're doing this is wrong. I think the way we're telling the story is wrong. And this is why, because I, and then that to me pushes me as a director, as a creative to take it to another level. You know, it doesn't make me, cause I can't, I can't see it in my eye just by myself. You know, there's these other amazing 17 people in the rehearsal room who have all got different lived experiences and who are all unique. And, and, and that uniqueness needs to be told through their eyes, really. Um, so, yeah, I can't wait. Uh, we've got Jeanette here says, uh, well done, Stephen. I'm very proud of you, young man. Is that, is that, is that Miss Tubner? <laughs> it must be a <laughs> surprise with your current achievements. Is that Miss Tavener? Miss Tavener, is that you? Is that is that where, who, who is this person that you, you think an old teacher? Yeah, she was. If it is her, I think it is her because I do remember her name being Jeanette. Um, if it is her, she was amazing in secondary school and really, yeah, one of the most amazing. And I think if if I'm right, um, her. And, and another teacher called Miss Ellis. There they are. Oh my God, it's <laughs> crazy. Ah, yeah. Oh, and another teacher called Miss Ellis, like really supported me in my like time in secondary school because I also came, I came from Swansea to Tottenham and I sort of really didn't feel like I felt in, felt like I was able to fit in as a black man. Um, because I sort of didn't have the cultural references that a lot of people had um, in, in, in London. And I felt isolated in that. And it was so amazing to have Miss Tabner and Miss Ellis support me in my training, where I felt like I didn't have those people who looked like me to be able to support me on a regular basis. And Miss Ellis, because I didn't have the money to, and my parents didn't have the money to, Miss Ellis paid for my blazer so that I didn't feel like the odd one out in the school because I didn't have a blazer, I didn't have it, you know, I wasn't wearing a blazer and she paid, uh, oh, now she's now Jeffrey, and now she paid, and she paid for my blazer. Um, and it's wonderful, it's, it's like, I always, have always held those two people as important, you talked about as influencers, who are your influencers? And they're as important people because they allowed me to be, you know, and they pushed me to be who I want to be. And they wasn't ever been like, you can't do this. You, you know, whenever I came up with ideas or things that I wanted to do as a student, um, you know, in year eight or year seven or whatever, they were like, okay, cool, do this, do that. How can we support you? And that's important to me in my practice. So I'm like amazed. They're even on this. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, Zach says, love what you're doing, mate. Um, Henry says, uh, brilliant, Stephen. Diversity in the arts. Agree totally. Um, really wonderful. Well, that was a nice little blast from Pa. I think you've yeah. been on quite a quite a bit, which is wonderful. I think that also the telling of stories. You know, we're talking about. We had uh, Kate O'Donnell on, um, who uh, 
what is it, trans lives uh, matters and so on and so forth. And uh, we were talking that the important thing about storytelling is that, you know, I can I could direct a, a play about, you know, um, you know, black people or Asian people or so on and so forth. But when I walk out onto the street, I will not be uh, racially abused. Simple as. I have not ever experienced that. Um, or, uh, you know, what, um, you know, uh, gay men, gay women, uh, trans people, you know. So it is so important to have in the room at all times someone that can actually guide that story. Do you, do you agree it, the, the importance yeah, of that? definitely. I feel it's important. I, I, um, I always think it's important that there are various people in various positions who represent people. That's a very weird way of saying, I think it's important to have people who look different in every position and not just as the highest position, but that might be a stage manager who looks after me um, or looks after the schedule of my actors. That's important that that person is representative to those because that when I'm off, they're gonna be in direct contact to that person. Um, it feels important to me that they understand whoever is in all those positions understands the lived experiences of different people. Um, that to me is important because I feel like it's again that thing of like drama schools, what drama schools have done is that they've said, okay, cool, the student body needs to change, but they haven't really changed the structures. And that's the annoying thing. That's the frustrating thing. Because we're also asking you to change these structures that do not allow black bodies, brown bodies, working class bodies, um, allow those bodies to be themselves. Um, so I'm asking you to change those structures as well as changing the bodies who are in that room. Um, so sometimes it feels like, okay, cool, we have that person who's there to guide that story. Cool, they're guiding that story. But who's the person commissioning that story? Who's the person, you know, producing that story? Who's the person marketing it? How do they, how are they gonna market that show? How are they gonna tell, make sure that everyone who represents that story is able to see it, even if they're not in theatre? Um, and that's so important. Yeah, brilliant. I love it. Uh, Jay says, totally agree. It's hard when half of the cast is black and there are no black creators on the team or even working on the show. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, just really think of, if you that. Say that again, uh, sorry. sorry. Just on that, I think it's really alienating because, well, of course it's really alienating, but I've been in a lot of rooms where I am the only black person in, in, in that room and we're doing a show and um, I may be the associate director or the assistant director and the show might not even be about black people, and it's not. Um, and there's a few black people in the cast, and um, we're talking this and we're talking, and, and sometimes I feel like I have to say, well, do you know how that's gonna affect that person if they do it in that way? Do you know what you're asking them to talk about? Um, have you thought about that? And sometimes it's about saying to whoever that person is, have you thought how that thing might um, affect that black person? You know, have you? Have you actually thought how can we make places accessible for disabled people um, and what that means? Um, and I think that's sometimes what it's about because it is alienating to have creators who are no, no black per people, sorry, can't speak now, um, no black creators, creatives in that space, in that room. But it's also quite scary when you're the only one who's having to be kind of fighting and doing that. Um, and sometimes those people have no clue, no idea how that makeup is going to affect that black person or that brown person. And um, no idea that if you're asking them to do that voice, you're asking them to do that accent, which has connotations of colonization, which has connotations of slavery. They have no idea of these things. And yet they put a lot of black actors, a lot of brown actors in places where it's very harmful and very painful. And um, yeah. And I think that comes back to what I was saying earlier. Just stop telling stories that we've heard a thousand times and thinking yeah. they'll be reversed by putting some brown and black actors into them. Like, actually, let's find the right stories to tell. And that's, you know, let's just put those on stage. Why yeah. can't we do that? Um, I think that is a, I think that's a, a big thing for it. I just want to say we've got uh, 10 minutes left. So 
If you have questions, please, uh, if you're a subscriber, pop them in the live comments now so we can see them. Uh, it can take, due to the wonders of modern technology, it can take a little while for us to get to them. So uh, I don't want to uh, miss your questions. Um, you know, there we go. So when uh, with uh, you start at Arts Ed, hopefully in September, will that be virtual? Do you know yet? Or hopefully physical or, you know, the, a bit of both. Um, I think we're, we're sort of responding to what the government's telling us to do, yep. um, which isn't very clear at the moment because they're not very clear people. Uh, but we're doing physical uh, in the real life and also virtually, but we're also preparing ourselves to go back. If it needs to go to absolute virtual, then we will go absolute virtual. Um, but we feel like it's really important that those students have physical contact with us. Um, especially that they're paying so much to study in some of these schools. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. And will you still have directing projects? What, how, what's going to happen? How are you going to keep that going alongside the, uh, the, the teaching? Yeah, I think I'll still have writing projects. I think directing projects will be harder to manage in that sense. But I think it's important. I always say that it's important that the, the group that I'm working with um the the artists that i'm working with have a it's important that i am also an artist and it's not about me saying 10 years ago i was an artist and i'm now telling you how to be an artist because that doesn't work um do you know what i mean because they don't see that 10 years ago the industry was really different to what it is now 20 50 years ago it was different uh, yeah. and the problem is we have people who used to be in the industry 50 years ago telling you know young artists that this is the industry you don't know the industry you know so it feels yeah. important for me to still be making or having my ear and in in the industry and knowing what's happening because yeah. i'm also informing those those artists who are going to go into that industry and if i don't inform them properly then i'm not equipping them um, and then they fell and then i fell <laughs> I, I agree. Again, going back to LSMT where I trained, we were taught by professionals. They were all active professionals. Mm -hmm. And I think that made a huge difference uh, to, to our learning. And it was only a year course. And, you know, but um, I think that was that was huge. And we could actually go and see the tutors in shows or see shows that they actually directed or choreographed. And that, I think, increased that level of of fire um uh, which was which was really really wonderful um writing so let's touch on that just a little bit what for any budding writers out there and i think you know I, i'm always uh, actors like well I, I, i'd love to be a writer i don't know where to start and it's just I, I always say look just start by telling a paragraph of a story about yourself just start there Write that down and see what that sounds like, and then just move on to there. Biographical is always great. Or if you see a, you know, a caterpillar in the garden, tell the story about its journey. Start really simple. What what advice would you say to people that want to get into writing or think that they might have a story to tell? What's your approach about putting that pen to paper the first time? Yeah, I think the first thing I will say is that anyone can write, um, and um, you know, don't get bogged down about trying to be an amazing writer. There's no thing that doesn't exist. And don't get bogged down in wanting to copy people's styles of writing. Everyone writes their own style. Shakespeare wrote their own style. I'm not going to copy Shakespeare. That person writes their own style. I'm not going to copy that person. This is my style. This is how I write. Um, and you either like it or not. And this is how I'm going to continue writing. Um, and you, you, you can see it. You, the writers that we see are on they have all different styles. David Hare is a different kind of writer to Debbie Tucker Green. You know, in terms of style, it's different the way they both write. Um, so there's no point of trying to copy anyone, just be you and write the stories. I think also write the stories that you want to tell that are important to you. Um, that's important because there's someone who wants to see those stories. Brilliant. Definitely. Um, so uh, what uh, we always get asked this uh, lockdown. I mean, it's been crazy. What are we five months now or something like that? Five and a half months of literally rocking uh, on Zooms. Um, what uh, piece of advice for uh, I'm going to give you a list of people here now. Piece of advice for people just going into training. Piece of advice for people who graduated this year. I mean, 
across the board that's i feel that's one of the hardest things whether they've you know um graduate from a law degree or an arts degree or whatever just you know not being able to put that you know all that training into into action what what's your advice for any student that's about to go to training or go to their third year or has just left in how to handle what what we've just gone through what is there anything that you would could pass on to someone how to handle the lockdown yeah just or just how like you know what what this what this world is looking like right now as a, as a, as an actor is there any any piece of advice that you could give anyone that's just you know apprehensive about going to drama school or they they've just left drama school and you know obviously they've come into an industry that isn't happening at the moment any advice to them i think um I don't know. I think what I've really gotten out of the lockdown, personally, is it gave it has given me time to reflect on my practice, um, and to reflect on the kind of stories I want to tell, the way I want to do stuff, and, and why that is. Um, and I think any actor who's been through this process kind of has to have that reflection if they've had it already, because there's been so much time. You might have had it, you know, watching Netflix or doing whatever, or you know. Um, having that time to reflect on what are the stories I want to tell, what are the projects I want to be involved in, and how do I tell those stories? Um, that's sort of the kind of advice I'd give to people. Because I think when you come into drama school and you, you, you know, when you come into the industry, you're like, I'm an actor, this is the only thing I can do is act. And that's rubbish. Actors are the most amazing storytellers. Um, so I think a lot of actors need to think of themselves much broader to that. They need to think about being an artist and and how their artistry fits in what they want to do and what why they want to do that you know yeah that's sort of the advice i'd kind of give if there is i mean i'm still going through lockdown like <laughs> yeah. so i don't have the most amazing advice but it has really helped um to reprogram me in the sense because we're not i think it's really weird to say we're going we're restarting um, sort of what the government is saying is we're restarting this project restart. And actually it's not we're restarting is we're re new. We're a new world. Um, we've seen so many things have happened in this short five months that have, that wouldn't have happened if we were yeah. still going on because that's how London we are. That's, you know, we're so used to going boom, 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 boom. I can't get here. I need to get an Uber. I can't get there. I need to get on the train. Boom, boom, boom. Life's so fast. Deadlines need to be met here and here. And actually, lots of things have slowed down because they've always needed to slow down. You know, yeah. that's that's just the way the world is. And we're coming into a new world that is different. Um, so we need to think about how we enter this new world rather than saying, I'm going to enter the same because it's not going to be the same. Um, yeah, that's all it. Love that. Um, and we're going to just end now here. Uh, Henry says, completely appreciate that feeling of being the only black person. In my course is all white people and all my teaching staff are white. Blows my mind. Um, Stephen, that is it. I think we probably could have gone on for another hour. I certainly could have. Thank you so, so much for your time today. We absolutely have loved having you on here and we hope that you will come back and maybe do do a session with us on here. Um, no doubt lots of people are going to hear the thank yous will start coming in. I love that two of your uh, old teachers were on here as well. Yeah, that was spectacular. Thank you so much, Miss Ellis and Miss Tabner. I love that. I'm going to take you out of the yeah. live. Mr. Uh, I'm going to take you out of the live stream, but don't go anywhere because I'll, I'll say goodbye to you in a second. Stephen Kavuma, thank you so, 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 so much for your time. Thank you. Ah, oh, brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, we hope you enjoyed that. We certainly did. Um, just absolutely fantastic. Um, so great to have uh, someone like Stephen on our site or his experience, what he's about to do. Um, so I hope you found that very useful. Coming up at three o'clock, uh, so in 30 minutes, we have our first acro session, uh, starting with handstand uh, workshop with Aisha Numa. Uh, that's three to four. This is for the basics. I'm very excited about this. I will be trying it um, without a uh, shadow of a doubt. So uh, we will see you back then. 
thank you once more. I'm going to just bring these up on the screen for Stephen. Um, please come back. Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you. Thank you. Great discussion. Thank you for everyone. Thank you for joining us. 